It's as if we've wandered the desert. Travelers without a home. Together yet alone in this uncertainty. An uncommon time, unexpected, undefined, binds us, unites us, does not divide us, but reminds us of who we are. A body, not a building, unrelenting, unyielding, persevering, revealing the faithfulness of God. Maybe this virus has started a fire inside us, ignited us, inspired us to live louder, love harder, care deeper. Six feet, six miles, or a world apart. Our calling remains the same. For we are the body of Christ. Hello. Thank you for worshiping with us today. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This week, Mr. M. L. Kofer left his earthly home to join his God and loved ones in heaven. He was not only a beloved father and grandfather, he was a pillar of our church and our community. We pray for comfort for the family and loved ones promised in Psalms 147.3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds their wounds. Ecclesiastes 3 tells us there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die. This week we give praises and celebrate the birth of Bo Garrison Harp. We give praises to God for the ability to worship in our homes or wherever we are. We thank God for his unending love and compassion. We continue to give praises and prayers for our caregivers, medical workers, delivery personnel, frontline workers, those serving in the military and truck drivers. We give praises to our police officers who risk their lives to serve and protect us and lift prayers for appropriate reform within police departments. In this time of tribulation, we pray for wisdom for our world, national, state, and local leaders. We pray for our school administrators as they make plans for students to continue their educations while we still face the spread of the coronavirus. As states have lessened restrictions and returned to modified activities, cases of the coronavirus have risen dramatically in states across the South. We pray that our neighbors will follow guidelines for safe distancing, washing hands, and wearing masks in public places to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. We continue to have hope in our research scientists as they strive to find a vaccine for COVID-19 and for better treatment. In this election year, we pray for our election officials, candidates, and voters as we determine local government leaders as well as our state and national leaders. We pray for comfort and peace for the families who have lost loved ones, including the family of Margaret Cruz. We lift praises and prayers for those who are recovering from illnesses, including Margie Crowley, Alton Phillips, Peggy Phillips, and Cassie Niles. We lift up Shelley Weir and David White and Michael Blackburn as they face complications in treatment and recovery. We pray for loved ones and neighbors with health needs, including Cheryl Brett, Betty Rogers, Sheila Larson, Douglas Jones, Donna Papoor, Paul Papoor, Sandy Cater, Roberta Ryan, Candy Rogers, Jean Carter, Russell Carter, Jessica Bland, Debbie Johnson, Danelle Moore, Kathy Reese, Karen Stalvey, Patricia Batten, Maggie Pruitt, Taylor Jean, Bertie Parrott, 
and all those affected by the coronavirus, especially Kaylee Timmons, who has tested positive this week. We pray for the homebound, including Ms. Jackie Eaton. We continue to pray for comfort for Mr. Coleman Sharp as he continues to mourn the passing of Ms. Jenny. We lift up those with unspoken prayers. We know our Father knows the need. Have compassion on me, Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. I stood in the cold room. The judge turned my way. It looks like you're guilty. But now what do you say? I spoke up, Your Honor. I have no defense. But that's when mercy walked in. Oh, mercy. Stand God saving grace, the blood was presented that covered my sin, forgiven when mercy.
morning, everyone. I'm so thankful to be able to be with you again today. And uh, I hope all of you are doing well. I hope you've had a great week. And I have something very exciting to share with you today. It's a letter. Uh, how many of you like to receive letters or cards in the mail? I'm not talking about an email or a text message, but an actual card or, or a letter in your mailbox. That's kind of rare these days. Most people either send an email or a text message. Very rarely do they take the time to write a note or a letter and mail it or send a card in the mail. But it's always exciting to me when I go to my mailbox and there's a letter or a card there for me. I can't hardly wait to open it to see what it says. And today I have a letter to share with you. And it's addressed to the children of Mount Olivet United Methodist Church. And it has our church address here in Fleming. And you know that on the um, upper corner of a letter is the return address, and that shows who the letter is from. And this letter is from James, the brother of Jesus, from Palestine. So I can't wait to open it and see what James has to say. And we know that he wrote one of the books in the New Testament of the Bible, so let's see what he says in this letter. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, you will face all kinds of trials. When you do, think of it as pure joy. In God's love, James. Hmm, that's kind of an odd letter, isn't it? He's telling us that when we face trials, we should consider it as joy. I'm thinking maybe we should just put this letter in the trash. What do you think? Well, you know, it is in the Bible. And he says that we should count it as joy when we go through trials. We know one thing for sure. We're all going to go through trials, aren't we? Everybody that, that lives on the earth faces adversity and trials and has trouble at some point in their lives. And right now, we know that all of us are going through a little bit of a trial with this uh, pandemic, this virus that's going around. It has caused a lot of um, financial hardship and physical um, hardship for a lot of people. It's changed a lot of the, the things that we do, the way that we do things, the way that we live, what we consider to be normal. It's um, changed all of that. And uh, it's caused a lot of uh, problems for a lot of people. And we're still going through it. We're not, we're not to the end of it yet. So how can we be joyful in this, this time of uh, crisis, this time of tribulation? That's what James is telling us to do. And that's what he, it says in the Bible that we should do. But how in the world can we do that? Well, let's think about it for just a minute. We know that God says in, in the Bible that he will never leave us or forsake us, that he will give us all the strength and all the wisdom that we need if we ask him as we go through these hard times. So when we go through these trials, um, what are some things that we can do to be able to be joyful during our time of trial? Think about that for just a minute. What are some things that we can do? Well, we know that we can pray. That's one way for sure that we can uh, be joyful and we can gain strength is to pray and to ask God to give us strength, to ask God to help us to have a, a good attitude. When James wrote this letter um, back in uh, the time of Jesus, when he wrote his real letter that's in the Bible in the New Testament, he wrote it to Christians who were scattered all over Palestine. They were going through a time of persecution because they were Christians. And uh, they were having some really tough times. And one of his goals in writing his letter to these um, Christians in Palestine was to help them to stay focused, to stay on, on the message that Jesus had come and had given to them. He wanted them to trust in Jesus and to trust in his message of love and deliverance. And, and to know that Jesus would help them and be with them through thick and thin. And so maybe we should try to do that same thing. We should try to focus and, and keep our focus on God and the fact that he is in control. He's in control of all things, and he'll give us the strength that we need to get through any trial or any tribulation in our lives. And if we just think about how wonderful God is and all the ways that he's helped us in, a, in the past, then we can have joy. Um, we can have joy during these times of trial. And one thing that we that happens when we go through a trial is uh, we usually learn from it. We grow and we gain wisdom 
And the next time we go through a trial, we're better able to handle it. And not only that, but maybe we can help somebody else who's going through a trial. Uh, we can let tell them about how God helped us when we were going through a trial and how he gave us the strength that we needed. So we're able to encourage others. And some of the things uh, that we learn as we go through trials is, um, is how to be strong and how to trust in God. So I hope that as we go through this pandemic, that you'll lean on God, you'll stay focused on him and on his message. You'll read your Bible and you'll pray. And there's just all kinds of verses in the Bible that can help you. And I wanna share a couple of those with you today. One of them is from Psalm chapter 121 and it's uh, verses one and two. It's one of my very favorites. And it says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. And then Nahum chapter one, verse seven says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. So those are two wonderful scriptures. And in the Psalms are all kind of encouraging scriptures to help you through difficult times. And I love Dr. Charles Stanley, and I watch him a lot on TV, and I read his books. And he has um, what he calls his 30 life principles. And two of those life principles Two of those life principles are about um, what we need to do when we face adversity. Um, and I want to share a couple of those with you. The first one is um, life principle number 29. And it says, we learn more in our valley experiences than on our mountaintops. And that means that we, we grow more and we learn more when we're going through rough times than we do when we're going through good times. And then also he has life principle number 26, and it says adversity is a bridge to a deeper relationship with God. A lot of times we go, grow closer to God when we're going through difficult times because it causes us to spend more time in prayer and in Bible study when we're going through a rough time. So we, it causes us to grow closer to God. So I hope that uh, during the coming weeks that uh, you'll do your best to focus on God, to focus on his love for you, on the fact that he is in control of all things, and to trust him so that you can have joy. You won't let this pandemic steal your joy, but you'll have joy in the Lord. And I, I pray that that's what um, happens to you. And let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear God, we know that we're all gonna face many difficult trials and tribulations in our lives. We thank you, dear Lord, that we don't have to worry. We don't have to be afraid. We can be filled with joy, the joy that comes only from knowing that you are in control of all things and that you love us and you will take care of us and you will never leave us or forsake us. We thank you for that comfort that you give. We thank you for that peace that passes all understanding that can come only from you. We ask you now that you would just help us to go out and to tell others about your love for them and about how they too can experience this joy. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name, amen. I hope you all have a wonderful week and I look forward to being with you next week. Bye-bye. Sometimes it takes a desert
Good morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, as we come together to uh, to spend time together and, and, and to go over and think about your word today, um, this is probably going to be a little bit untraditional, Lord. And so I just pray, Father, that, that you would make this right, that you would take whatever I'm going to say and make it be the words people need to hear. And I ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to tell you a story. A prosperous executive whose work required frequent travel decided to buy his own plane. He took flying lessons and was soon quite comfortable with his more convenient transportation. After a few years, he decided to purchase a pontoon plane so he could fly back and forth from his beautiful summer home on the lake. On his first flight in his new plane, he forgot, forgetfully started to head to the airport landing strip, and just as he had always done, Luckily, his wife was with him, and when she saw what he was doing, she chirped, Pull up, George! Pull up! You can't land on a runway! You have pontoons! You don't have wheels! Looking flushed and humbled, the businessman quickly hit the throttle and veered off toward the lake, landing safely in the still blue water. He shook his head ruefully and said, I don't know where my mind was. I just wasn't thinking. That's one of the dumbest things I've ever done. They opened the door and stepped out into the lake. Have you ever had a moment where you just aren't sure if you're coming or going? 
That's how I've been, especially today. Normally, I would be in writing my sermon pretty early in the week, but I got busy with work at the beginning of the week, and then to be honest, after Tuesday, I just couldn't much think about anything else other than Mr. M. Allen's family. I have sat in front of a blank monitor for a couple of hours now. Someone joked earlier that I should reuse a sermon from the past. I actually started looking through some of my old sermons that I had written over the years. Some brought back memories and others reminded me that I've got some empty spots in my memory. Things that I honestly just don't even remember. And also to be honest, um, a few of those ones from years past, I'd stop and pray and hope that they didn't actually, you know, damage anybody when I when I gave those sermons. Then Lynn Martin called. Um, I haven't spoken to her in a long time. We spoke in Mr. ML. We spoke of keys for locks and a little bit of politics and a bunch of other things that in the long run probably didn't matter much. We spent a few minutes just connecting as sister and brother in a way, to be honest, I am unable to speak to my own physical brother. It made me think. Earlier today, a comment was made that not everyone is a child of God. Wow. I really had to give that a lot of thought. I suppose the answer to that is truly in how you use the phrase. You see... All humans are created in God's image. Even after the fall of Adam into sin, Scripture describes God making humans a little lower than the angels and crown them with glory and honor. In fact, after Noah's flood, God declares that the warrant for capital punishment stems from humans being God's image bearers. The Apostle James warns Christians not to verbally disparage somebody else. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Paul in Acts, when addressing the people of Athens, makes the statement that we are his. And by his, he means God. We are his offspring. I suppose the simple way of looking at this would be like this. If I have a son, but he rejects me, and he moves away and never returns home, is he still my son? I suppose he is. But does he get any of the benefits of being my son? No. By his act, he has broken the family bond of parenthood. I believe that each person who is born is the child of God. Or maybe put a different way, was created by God. The only one who has the power of creation. I also believe that every person, by word or deed, has the power to break those bonds. And while it may not be easy to talk about, as a father... I can decide to break those bonds as well. For whatever reason, I can kick my child out of the house and have nothing else to do with them. I, I'll be honest with you. I praise God that I have a son who I can call not just my physical son, but my spiritual brother. Here's the thing. God can do that too. When the people of Judea refused to follow God's commandments, God called his covenant with them void. They stopped being his children. But listen to this. The opposite's true as well. The father can take a son that was not born to him. And a son can love another as a father. I have gotten to see that so many times in my lifetime uh, of people building those relationships with folks outside of any normal family structure, but they are good. 
I have had one earthly father, but I've had many spiritual fathers. People I've called on for advice and guidance and have responded in love and caring. Their names, even though many of them are gone, I still hold in reverence and respect. Men like Nick Maris, my wife's papu, Greek for grandfather, who became very much to me my papu. Churchmen like Mick McCooey, a man who I got to meet when I was the pastor, actually before I was the pastor at Union United Methodist Church, who I grew to love and, and to see a, stretch, a strong man of God, a, a caring man for other people. And yes, today, of course, my mind turns to Mr. Amell, someone who, as I mentioned earlier today, has treated me like one of his own. My talk with Linda today reminded me that when we become children of God, in the sense that we often think of as Christians, in other words, those who accepted the redemption of Christ's blood, we are brought into a new family. Here's the thing. Miss Linda and I probably disagree about more things than we agree about. Lord knows I've gotten on her nerves in the past and she on mine. But there is an undercurrent there, a strand, if you will, that cannot be broken, that has bound us together in a way that allows me to love her in such a strong way and for her to love me in an exceptional way. Over the last few weeks, we've been reading in Matthew about the sending out of the disciples and the way um, that in one passage we even read that brothers will tear brothers apart. It kind of amazes me that the news makes such a big deal about how religion is responsible for tearing apart some households where someone doesn't want to follow, say, Christianity. And maybe it goes a completely different way and how that's torn apart the family. And I'll be honest with you, I want to almost say, duh. Don't get me wrong. I, I want us to love each other, but the Bible is very clear about this. Our decision to follow Christ will cause family strife. It will cause us to be separated from folks. I made the comment today that I don't have a lot much in common with the people of Mount Olivet Church. I've never farmed. I certainly don't fish. I don't have strong family ties. I was born a Yankee, but have since repented. I have learned that my thoughts about the whole COVID situation matches exactly one half of our church council. Yet, I love these people. And they love me. Why? Because we are of one family. We are children of God. We may not think the same, do the same things, have the same backgrounds, dream of the same future. But in a very real way, we are the same. For we all love God. Yes, our family can be dysfunctional at times. I can only imagine how many people left the funeral today wondering why in the world so many people in the church celebrate the fact that they have a okay pastor, even if it's the okayest type. But we are God's children. And we are God's children together. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 26-28 So, after a very long and tiring week, a week where I got to see so many of our church family doing what was best for others, instead of what may have been best for themselves. 
I want to say this. Thank you, Matt Olivet, for showing the world what it means to be children of God. And thank you, Linda Martin, for reminding me through a phone call how good it is to be a part of this family. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for these people. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of families here at Mount Olivet, in Union, in Hagen, and actually the entire world. Thank you for bringing me into your family, Lord. Thank you for calling me your child. Thank you for guiding my steps. And thank you, Lord, for guiding all of our steps. Thank you for your mercy, for your kindness, but most of all, for your love. In Christ's holy name I pray. Amen. This is the place where we pray. This 
Let's call this the close of a long week. Let's call this the opening of another fantastic week that we get to serve God. Um, I pray that today's service has been a blessing to you. I pray that this week, as you, so many of you, have labored in service or held us all up in prayer has been a good week. I also pray that this right now will be the start of a wonderful week. Remember, I love you. But God loves you more. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Great things He has done. So loves He the world that He gave us His Son. Who yields in His life and blood atonement for His sin. And opened the life it's death. Honk, honk.